So we're going to talk about uh, the treatment of post chiari occipital pain with nerve stimulation. I think we chose this topic because it was uh, attracting a lot of attention among the doctors and patients worldwide. And, uh, and this is something that we're going to talk about for maybe the next 20 minutes or so. And then we'll hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss it in, uh, in chat rooms and individually afterwards. I must say that I have a lot of things to disclose. I work with different companies, educating doctors and, and manufacturers, but, but there are really no conflicts related to this particular presentation. The, I'm very biased towards neurostimulation because I've been using it for a long time for a variety of different issues, including for pain in the occipital area of the head. So the Chiari has been a subject of my investigations as well. And over the years, I've written and done research on this topic. Um, and, and I was particularly interested because of recent publications. And recent publications have to do with a pain in Chiari patients to the point that it's, there was a question raised whether or not occipital Chiari, neurology and Chiari malformation are um, actually two different facets of the same condition. Uh, moreover, our colleagues uh, have published um, experience in the use of occipital nerve stimulation for treatment of headache in Chiari patients after the surgery and before the surgery to decompress the posterior fossa. Some of this was published in my book and I was very interested in that topic, turning out that, uh, that I have a lot of patients of myself who I operate on this. And I thought summarizing this and discussing the options would be of interest for the patients and the doctors. The, uh, interestingly enough, the occipital neurology or pain in the back of the head is, a, is sometimes called Arnold neurology. And as you know, the Arnold Chiari malformation used to go that way before we started using the term Chiari malformation alone. Uh, and Arnold, who described occipital neurology, was an anatomist in Germany uh, in the 19th century. Now, he uh, did not work with Hans Chiari, who described Chiari malformation. But he was actually father of Julius Arnold, who uh, described the case of what we think now was Chiari uh, two malformation in the newborn, uh, and after whom the, the, his pupils called this uh, condition Arnold Chiari malformation. Now, we don't use the word Arnold for Chiari anymore, but the Arnold father was uh, the first descriptor of occipital neurology, which has to do with the pain in the back of the head. Now, we don't use this eponym anymore. We call it just simply occipital neurology or pain in the occiput. And it is a, a clinical presentation of this condition, which, as opposed to actual Chiari malformation, which has a multitude of symptoms. The occipital neuralgia is a condition that presents specifically with pain. And the pain uh, in patients with Chiari and in patients presenting to clinic with diagnosis of occipital neuralgia can be pretty much everywhere in the head. And it's important to differentiate this um, uh, as it has significant impact on the choice of treatment. So if you look at this picture, you can see all these patterns of pain. But you can see from the very beginning that some of them really have nothing to do with occipital neurology. The occipital nerves do not go to the eye. Uh, they do not go to the forehead, but they do cover the back of the head. And then the question is, is this uh, an example of occipital neurology or are the other two things that you see in the center of the screen and on the uh, right lower corner, whether those are typical occipital neurology cases? Nevertheless, this is something that uh, kind of subject to uh, intense discussions among the doctors and patients. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, the diagnosis is made and usually uh, uh, based on the fact that occipital nerves are very well-defined nerves that travel in the back of the head. The anatomical considerations have to do with the representation of the pain uh, in uh, the, each individual patient. Now, keep in mind, there are multiple occipital nerves. There are actually three occipital nerves on each side of midline. One is called greater occipital nerve, one is called lesser occipital nerve, and there's a very small one called third occipital nerve very close to the midline itself. And this is something that has been published in different studies and the anatomy varies from person to person, but there's general correlation and there are general rules about where the nerves are located. And why is it important? Well, because there's an overlap between different nerves. And as you can see here, when we talk about treatment of Chiari malformation or the symptoms correlated to Chiari itself, they have intri intricate connection to the occipital nerves because the pain happens to be uh, in the area where um, uh, the tonsils um, are herniating and pushing uh, on the meninges or the foramen magnum is pushing on the tonsils. And in addition to that, our surgery that we do in that location has effect on occipital nerves because those nerves get mangled and cut and distorted and put pressure on and get scarred down. And therefore the patients with Chiari can have pain without surgery, just from underlying condition or they can have pain from surgical interventions that we use to treat the Chiari. So patients with Chiari malformations are not uncommon to have occipital pain, and some of them do have typical occipital neuralgia. And when it happens like that, then there's, it makes perfect sense to treat occipital neuralgia as you would do in patients 
without carry malformation because occipital pain deserves its own treatment. And therefore, if pain does not disappear from standard uh, interventions for carry, then it may say, make sense for us to intervene specifically for pain. And one of the things that we do routinely is we do what's called occipital nerve blocks. We're trying to figure out if the nerves are involved in generation of pain. We want to see if the numbness in the area of pain has to do with uh, uh, relief of pain. And sometimes this may be challenging to do in patients after Chiari surgery because the blocks become a little bit more tricky and more dangerous because there's no bone underneath. But in patients before surgery or patients without Chiari at all, occipital nerve blocks are very straightforward and simple interventions that help us to understand the involvement of each nerve in the pain production. So you can see here that the nerve blocks are done with simple needle inserted through the uh, skin towards the nerve. The nerve itself does not get injected, but the medication goes around the nerve and makes the area of the that's supplied by this nerve numb temporarily. And if the pain is gone, then most likely this, um, um, uh, this is connected. And therefore, it makes sense for us to intervene on the occipital nerves trying to relieve the pain. And what's, what's the treatment for occipital neuralgia? So first of all, we try to correct underlying pathology. If somebody has uh, um, uh, abnormalities in, in the cervical, uh, tiny cervical junction or in the facet joints in upper cervical level or instability, we try to fix that. The nerves can be decompressed. There can be what's called neurolysis when you relieve pressure from the nerve. You can do microvascular decompression. It's been described for occipital nerve. You can actually do the excision of the nerve, removing the nerve itself. You can go more proximally and cut the nerves as they come out of the spinal cord, which is called rhizotomy. Or you can do what's called ganglionectomy. That's when we remove the ganglia of the uh, upper cervical nerve root, trying to relieve the pain permanently. But the stimulation has become more commonly used for this because of many different um, advantages. It's non-destructive, it's testable, it's adjustable, so the patients can actually control the amount of stimulation they receive specifically to control the pain. So occipital nerve stimulation does not solve any problems other than pain, and therefore we use it only for patients for whom the pain is predominant um, uh, condition. So occipital nerve stimulation has been around for a long time, and we'll talk about this. We also can stimulate cervical spinal cord, uh, which may not be a good option for patients with scary because of the problems with anatomy, but is a good option for other patients whose anatomy is rather normal. And here is a, an anatomical considerations. Yeah? As you can see, the nerves, the occipital nerves, travel in a predictable fashion coming out of cervical spine and going towards the back of the head. But they have very um, uh, intricate relationship with surrounding vessels. And sometimes vessels are pushing on the nerves. Sometimes they are uh, compressing the nerves against the fascia. And this is something that we see frequently. And that's why all these in interventions exist, because we can decompress the nerves or cut them out and try to eliminate the pain that way. The ganglionectomy is a procedure that has been developed uh, many, many years ago, sometime in mid 20th century, that involves removal of the ganglion, which is a source of the nerve cells for the occipital nerves. And that's a procedure that's rarely done now, but has been very well described for treatment of occipital pain. And occipital neuralgia definitely keeps ganglionectomy as a part of treatment algorithm. Now, the, um, the, the idea here is that the ganglion can be reached outside the spinal canal, so you don't have to go into the person's uh, fecal sac or touch the spinal cord. You can find this ganglia outside of the uh, nerve roots, and you can remove them with a very good margin of safety. So between C1 and C2, when you have the C2 ganglion, the treatment can be done without uh, removing bone at all. But at C2, C3 level, where the C3 ganglion is, we really have to drill a little bit of bone just to expose the nerve and the ganglia. So those are procedures for ganglionectomy. And like I said, it's rarely done now, but we just recently had a case published when we removed this ganglion patient with occipital neuralgia. And to everybody's surprise, we discovered that there was actually herpes infection inside the ganglion. And it wasn't herpes zoster like we do with post herpetic neurology. It actually was herpes simplex type one, something that we use, we frequently encounter patients around their lips or, or mouth. And, uh, and there was a very unusual and unexpected finding. And maybe that was the source of the pain. Now, occipital nerve stimulation is something that we use for treatment of pain. You can see on this slide that there's an actual electrode sitting under skin, kind of go over the course of the occipital nerves. And that's what we use to stimulate the nerves and trying to control pain that way. This has been uh, an interesting um, uh, approach uh, described back in 1999 by our colleagues in Dallas when they introduced this percutaneous insertion. So the electrodes could be implanted through the skin without big uh, surgical interventions, just to put electrode in the area of the nerve, stimulate it, and get pain under control. And ever since 99, this become 
um, more or less commonly done procedures. So we published our results in early 2000s and so did many other people. And we started using it for unilateral or bilateral occipital pain um, uh, with very encouraging results. Interestingly enough, these are some examples of my practice. You can see that the patients, some of them actually had carried the compression, some did not. Uh, but the electrode always goes uh, under skin, above the fascia where the nerve travels. And by catching the right nerve or right nerves, we can cover um, the area of pain and we hope to control the pain uh, that way. The uh, question comes uh, inevitably whether or not this is experimental or new procedure. And it turns out, really, nothing is new. I mean, in, in the uh, world of neuromodulation, you can find old papers that describe occipital nerve stimulation done in mid-80s or even early 80s or even in the 70s. And they all mention treatment of occipital neuralgia with nerve stimulation, something that we conveniently forgot in the 2000s. So the procedural details are very straightforward. When we put a nerve stimulator over the nerve, we want to make sure that the electrode goes in the right place. So you can put one electrode or two electrodes, depending on pattern of pain. You can go from the side or from the center. And that pretty much depends on individual patient's anatomy and on the surgeon's preference. But ultimately, the electrodes have to go over the course of the nerve. And you can see multiple publications showing how the electrodes are inserted from the midline. I personally don't like, like that. So my electrodes usually go from the side. I make incision behind the ear. And that's how the electrodes are inserted, either one or two electrodes. We publish detailed description on how to put these electrodes in the right place with nice illustrations showing unilateral and bilateral placement, how to tunnel these electrodes and ultimately go all the way to the chest where the battery stays. And this is something that we, uh, we use routinely for patients with occipital neuralgia for a variety of reasons. We have special needle designed specifically for that, but it's, it's not being used and everybody just bends their needle their own way just to com uh, compensate for this. The electrodes have to be anchored so they don't move around because neck is very mobile area. And as you can imagine, that when patient moves their head, the electrodes can move. So the anchoring is important. And there's several ways to do that. There's anchors. And I don't want to um, uh, complicate this presentation too much and bother you with all the surgical details. But but keep in mind, this is very um, um, uh, intricate, but at the same time, very straightforward procedure. And ultimately, you just want to have any kinks along the course of the electrodes. There are some techniques when people suture the electrodes in place, they use special um, uh, anchors for that. And, and that I feel that's a little bit an overkill and I don't use that. I use much simpler approach uh, when I just put electrodes through the needle and tunnel them and, and stitch them inside. There's our colleagues from Israel a long time ago published a way to put electrodes retrogradely. And that's an excellent uh, point as well, but uh, rarely if ever needed. So the generator, and most electrodes that we use uh, now are still requiring a generator, which is a power source, even though there's some new technology that allows you to use this stimulation without generators. But generator is like a pacemaker, essentially something that delivers energy to the electrodes. And uh, there were some publications recommending putting generator all the way to the flank or the buttock. Uh, I don't do that. I put my generators in the chest, like I do with vagal nerve stimulation or deep brain stimulation devices. As a matter of fact, if the patient has a nice tattoo there, then you can make its generator look like a pedestal for this. But uh, jokes aside, this is something that we use routinely and we surveyed our patients and it turns out that most of them would prefer that location for their stimulation devices. And then there's a technique of how to position the patient, something that probably has more relevance to surgeons who do that. But there's a way to do this in a safe and effective way uh, when you position the patient and get access to both sides of midline and the generator in the same approach so you don't have to uh, redrape the patient and reposition them during the surgery. Now, there are many complications and we we'll warn our patients that things can happen. And even though it doesn't happen often, you can be prepared for this because like with everything else, um, unless you're aware of complications, you cannot treat them well. Sometimes electrodes migrate and you can change it to programming and get them in the right place. Sometimes electrodes migrate a lot and then you have to go take the patient back and put electrodes into a uh, new position. Sometimes and electrodes migrate in instead of migrating out. And once again, you have to take the patient back to surgery and to revise them. But all of these are minor surgeries. All the implantations and revisions, they are considered minor interventions because we are not going into somebody's brain and we're not opening any large cavities and all of this done on outpatient basis. Interestingly enough, the electrodes, like any other man-made products, can break. And when they do break, they have to be replaced. And you can see that the electrodes do break with like where the contacts are or in the middle of the lead wires and this is well described in literature and and this is something we prepared our patients for interestingly enough it's not as uncommon as people think particularly in the mobile area of the neck uh, 
and therefore the, uh, uh, the, 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 there's some technological advancement now trying to make electrodes stretchable and so forth. The electrodes may be placed in the wrong depth, it happens sometimes, and if it's too superficial or too deep, then the patient can have symptoms. So when they're too deep, it contracts their muscles and they complain about that. If it's too superficial, then start eroding through the skin, and we've had that as well, as you can see, this occipital electrode, I mean, I published that when showing through the skin. Sometimes they're infected, sometimes they're not, and they're easy to fix, usually by revising the electrode. The generators can erode. These are the patients who have the major erosion of the generator. Usually it happens because of infection, and those things need to be taken out, and once again, it's something that should be prepared for, because things do happen. Incorrect depth has been described um, on uh, multiple occasions, so like this, for example, shows wrong placement of electrodes under the fascia. We don't want that. We want electrodes to stay under skin and above the fascia so it can catch the nerves uh, where the most acceptable to stimulation. This is probably the good position of the electrode. You can see it, it's above the muscle and under the skin. And I don't know if I can show that, if you can see my uh, mouth uh, uh, arrow here showing where the electrodes are. But they are literally it's sticking out. Um, uh, traveling from the ear all the way to the midline, and you can see all eight contacts of the electrode uh, covering, going over the course of the occipital nerves. The infections do happen, and sometimes we see patients coming with a pus coming from the incisions, and for those, the only treatment is to, um, to remove everything and wait for infection to heal. But there are certain steps you can do to minimize the risk of infection, and the surgeons are usually aware of those. There's an uh, uh, entire process to do that. But ultimately, for occipital nerve stimulation um, or occipital neurology treatment, we follow an algorithm. We want to make sure that's, that's what the patient has. And for this, uh, we um, uh, go through certain steps of diagnostic and treatment uh, uh, interventions. We start by working up the source of the pain and trying to find the reason people are hurting. Sometimes it's because of the um, instability or some facet joint involvement. And those are usually treated with either uh, cervical spine surgery or the ganglion decompression or the nerve decompression. If things fail to improve, then the next step to consider will be the occipital nerve stimulation trial. And the trial can be successful or not. Obviously, if it's a successful trial, we go ahead with occipital nerve stimulation. If it's not successful, then we proceed with a workup for possible ganglionectomy. So we do the ganglion block. If it's effective, we do one or two level ganglionectomy. If it doesn't work, then we try to uh, um, uh, figure out if something else is involved. And ultimately, we we figure out if the patient has no response to any of our interventions and go back to the uh, medical management. So this is something that was published well, more than 10 years ago by our colleagues in Oregon, but this algorithm still stays and I subscribe to it and I feel that that's, that's a good way to approach that. Now, interestingly enough, whenever we talk about occipital nerve stimulation, we get denial from insurance companies because they mentioned that this is an experimental approach and has not been proven. And to some extent they are correct, there was no large randomized studies for occipital nerve stimulation for occipital neuralgia with Chiari or without Chiari. But this has been around for a long time to the point that the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, which is our main national organization, has come up with these guidelines. And the guidelines documented that occipital nerve stimulation is actually evidence-based supported treatment for occipital neuralgia. These guidelines came out in uh, 2015. And ever since it came out, it became easier to get approval from insurance companies for use of this modality for patients with occipital pain. So those patients who suffer from occipital neuralgia can um, uh, count on their doctors to get approval for this intervention, because this is something that we can uh, easily um, implement for many patients with um, uh, pain in the occipital nerve distribution. And if we can show that it actually works because we do the trial, and we will see if it, uh, if it helps the patient. And then we can count on long-term improvement with relatively non-invasive and adjustable modality. So we can encourage the patients to try uh, using stimulation as a treatment of their pain um, uh, without cutting the nerves or without removing the ganglia. And in patients with Chiari malformation, either before or after surgery, if the occipital nerve pain or occipital neuralgia is a dominant uh, presentation, then I would definitely encourage um, uh, my colleagues and, and my patients to consider this as an option because they may get good pain relief, symptomatic relief, and functional improvement as a result of relatively straightforward intervention. And I want to wrap up my presentation by inviting you all to Chicago next year because we plan to have in-person conference. Hopefully by that time, the restrictions will be lifted and we will all feel safe to travel.
just like we were planning to do this year and had to switch to virtual format. But next year, we're planning to have our conference in July in downtown Chicago in Knickerbocker Hotel, which is a great um, a place uh, right in the middle of um, um, a magnificent mile and a Chicago loop uh, uh, to hold the next kind of conversation in person. Thank you very much for your attention.